You know, most modern fans tend to consider older science fiction campy. And I'm really generally annoyed at this when you apply it to Star Trek, the original series. Very little science fiction is actually camp. Camp is in an intentional kind of humor. And the best example of this always is the 1960s Batman TV series. That is a camp TV show. Not even the 1930s Flash Gordon serials are actually campy. They are not trying to be amusing. Um, in fact, in their era, they were intended to be and were taken seriously. They were certainly children's fare. They were not, you know, adult themes or anything like that that you would have seen, adult film that you would have seen around that time. But they weren't trying to be intentionally amusing. They were trying to be, in a, you know, uh, a serious adventure for those kids. And for most of the time, they were. Um, you know, kids of that era could get into Flash Gordon um, the way that uh, we might get into, um, you know, Star Wars today. They could become emotionally invested in it. Uh, and I mean the first Star Wars movies, the franchise and the cultural thing that it turned into is a whole other thing. But, you know, as a kid being able to get into, you know, that film when I was 12 years old, similar to the way that my great great grandparents maybe would have gotten into uh, Flash Gordon. But if you want to compare this, the 1980 Flash Gordon movie is the one that stars Sam J. Jones. That is camp. It is intentionally trying to be amusing in a campy way. But Star Trek's never been camp, not in any incarnation, not ever. The only place in Star Trek that you see camp is in the Pro Captain Proton serials that you see from time to time in Star Trek Voyager. P Captain Proton is camp, absolutely. But Voyager itself is not. All you're really seeing in older Star Trek, like Star Trek the original series, is a number of things. First is lower production standards. And that's because no one at that time ever imagined that anyone would ever be viewing these episodes in 1080p. When you see these in 1080p, you are watching in better quality than they watched in the dailies on a, on a screen the day after they shot them. You are seeing better quality there. These episodes were designed to be viewed on a crappy, low-definition, analog broadcast television. And on the best of days, the picture was never going to be crystal clear. And if you got a thunderstorm, it would be a nightmare. If your mother ran the vacuum cleaner, it would be a nightmare because they would be susceptible to all manner of electromagnetic interference. If you were too close to the transmitter, it would be bad. If you were too far away from the transmitter, it would be bad. Even if you were in the middle, you are still looking at crappy, low-def, analog broadcast television. Uh, like the like. Oh, hey, Larry, Larry. Nice to see you tonight, too. Um, but you simply couldn't make out the kind of detail on, that you can today. So the show was made with the TV production standards of that era in mind. And it wasn't anything unusual. If you go watch Bonanza, which was a much more successful program that ran concurrent, among other, other things, Bonanza was an incredibly long-running show. If you go watch Bonanza, you will see lots of horses on what are obviously sound stages in 1080p. They were taking exactly the same shortcuts because they never expected that this stuff was ever going to be viewed in 1080p. Uh, Dropper Dude says, you live in... Uh, uh, Albury, uh, I'm not sure what NSW is. I'm afraid I am a silly, uh, stupid American who doesn't know what... Um, New South Wales, that's what it is. Sorry, I wasn't me remembering it off the top of my head. So, and I, and I, uh, always nice to see people who come in from uh, other countries um, uh, and uh, help us. Yes, uh, B Bonanza was created to sell color TVs. Bonanza predated color TVs. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was one of the selling points, absolutely. Very, very popular program. Much, much more so than Star Trek ever was. But, again, if you watch those episodes now, yeah, they have some better production values when it gets into things like, you know, doing um, interior sets. Uh, their period pieces, you know, from that er from the era that's portraying. We get out into the open. Sometimes they do have some stuff that's on location. And sometimes they have horses walking in on sound stages with, you know, AstroTurf, the same as they did on Star Trek. Um, it was never intended to be seen in 1080p, not ever. Nobody ever thought it was. And hell, if, you know, they'd known back then that they were going to deal with a franchise that would start then, it would last more than half a century, uh, they would have done something very different with it, I'm sure. Second thing you deal with in Star Trek, the original series in particular, and lots of science fiction, a lot of the older science fiction that I review, if it's any good, 
um, is dated technological predictions. And what modern fans don't really understand is that even in the 1960s, the, this is what the best futurists of that era predicted. Everybody kind of agreed that this is where we were heading. They were thinking that we would have an imminent breakthrough in power generation. But what we actually got was a massive breakthrough in information technology. Back then, they assumed nuclear power was going to make everything else pretty much obsolete. It would get smaller. We'd have you know, spaceships that were driven by nuclear-powered engines. Um, and then they assumed also that computers would always be the size of a warehouse because that's the size of computers were back then, was the size of a warehouse. And they could not do what your phone in your freaking pocket can do. They were huge. Ah, uh, let's see. Droptooth says party lines in Perth, Western Australia were phased out around 1985. That may have been about when it happened in rural South Dakota. I don't know. I don't remember it that well. It's now been so long. I'm not sure if I was in high school. Maybe it was a little before that. So, uh, Sci-fi novels rarely predict the future. No sci-fi ever predicts the future correctly. But that's what you see in Star Trek. Um, they thought they were going to have a big breakthrough in power and that computers were always going to be huge. But what we were actually got were very few nuclear plants. And then we got giant breakthroughs in computing that allowed us to put this in your pocket, which is more computing power than it took to put man on the moon, by far, by several orders of magnitude. Then a uh, third thing that you deal with in older science fiction, and Star Trek in particular, is um, the uh, um, uh, effects, special effects that have advanced. Most people don't know this, newer, younger fans don't know, but Star Trek, the original series, was completely groundbreaking in terms of science fiction, its effects, and it would remain that way for a good 10 years or so until Space 1999 came around in the 1970s. Now, of course, today a good special effects artist can create better effects using a single computer and a CGI, but if you really insist on belittling the original series based on its special effects, just remember this. In 20 years, your kids or your grandchildren are going to belittle modern Kurtz Trek and its special effects for exactly the same reason. Things will advance and the kids will go, wow, that looks fake and stupid and cheesy and hokey. Um, another big factor is that storytelling, the way that stories have told themselves, have changed. Star Trek, the original series, was very dialogue heavy for a couple of reasons. Drop Zuth says, early optic fiber connections to the cities uh, sorted that out. However, most homes today still have copper from the node, like me, about 50 megabit per second is the best I have. Um, here in Lincoln, Nebraska, we have uh, fiber to the curb uh, for one. I, actually, no, I'm sorry. It's fiber to the home. Uh, I'm, I'm always, I'm not on it right now. I'm paying for the Internet uh, in the home in which I live. Uh, which I share with my, uh, with my mother. Yes, I'm living in my mother's basement for a variety of reasons. And uh, I'm paying for it now, and I'm always about this close um, to going to upping to the fiber because um, that would increase my bandwidth rather dramatically. But, um, yeah, that's what we have here, fiber right into the house. Fiber to the router is what it is. So Star Trek... One of the ways that storytelling's changed is Star Trek, the original series, was very dialogue heavy. And that was for a couple of reasons. One of them was to make up for the fact that they couldn't do certain types of effects. They had to talk about what was happening and the effects of whatever was going on because they could not technologically do those special effects. It was impossible at that time. Uh, USA Larry Larry says has miles and miles of dark fiber. Yes, that's true. I watched them put uh, fiber in to uh, North Sioux City. Um, why? The company that did that went out of business, and the fiber was dark. It may still be dark. North Sioux City, South Dakota, is a tiny, tiny town in real life. Uh, the Mar Marshall says with CG CG's trajectory, we will be able to generate CG actors that don't get paid thirty million a movie, or will look completely real time frame ten years or so. Yeah, I agree with you, Marshall. I keep thinking, you know, eventually they're gonna circle back around to Star Trek: The Original Series, and we will be seeing William Shatner and Leonard Nimoy and um, you know DeForest Kelly playing their their signature roles, and we will never know the difference. We will be uh, they will be completely real looking. 
Uh, Drop Truth says, Larry, Larry, 1984 and Brave New World were pretty spot on, but then they were written by Fabian Socialist Insiders. Uh, well, 1984 certainly is starting to come true. That's, you know, they were a little off by the decades, but... Uh, in any case, you know, the, the, the scripts are dialogue heavy in the original series, partly because they had to make up for the fact that they could not show these effects. Some of them were impossible to make. So you had to have the characters talking about what was happening and how it was affecting the ship or whatever was around it. Secondly, it was dialogue heavy because a lot of the writers, not all of them, but a lot of them had come either, out either from literary science fiction. Some were literary science fiction authors who had been asked, hey, would you write for this show because they wanted to have quality scripts. Or they were people who had previously written quite a lot of radio. Now, obviously, a written narrative is going to be more heavily, heavily influenced by words. You know, So if you get somebody coming out of the... Uh, the uh, you know, literary word, world, they're going to be more into words. And radio, well, it had been the television of its era for a couple of decades. They had everything that we have on TV now. They have, you know, dr they had dramas, comedies, sitcoms, soap operas. Um, they even had reality TV shows. They had cop shows. Um, the, the difference, of course, is detective shows, everything, science fiction. The difference was that they didn't have any kind of visual medium to it, and so they were more dialogue heavy by necessity. So if you get people who are coming out of that and coming out of a literary tradition, then you're going to have a Star Trek that is more heavy on dialogue than it's going to be on special effects. Uh, the Shuttle Galileo had to wait until they built a real one. Yeah, the whole issue of the Shuttle Galileo was interesting. Uh, we back here. Marshall says, we know they aren't real. Others may not. Yeah, Marshall says, uh, Drop Deuce is more royalty fees. And uh, Drop Deuce says, Arnie had, to, had himself fully 3D body scanned about the time of ter Terminator 3. Yeah, they won't need the full 3D body scan at all. They'll just be able to recreate these people based on existing footage. You know, kind of what they, maybe with, I don't even know that they'll need another actor. You know, uh, it was done kind of eerily and in not a good way for Rogue One with Grand Moff Tarkin. Um, give it another 10 years, like Marshall says, and we probably will not, we would not be able to tell the difference. Who knows? Knowing the Lucas tradition, they may just, may just go back and um, redo Grand Moff Tarkin for that movie so that it doesn't look quite so kind of creepy. But... Um, that's that's one of the things about it, and and then of course is the fact that um, in modern writers they can take advantage both of modern visual effects and they also come to this with a long tradition now of how they tell stories in a more visual way. With a visual medium, it is always better to show rather than just tell, and so they the writers themselves come at this with this okay. We need to show, not tell. Show, not tell. And we have, you know, more money than God. And we can do all the, you know, the CGI that we want to do. But all of this taken into account, this is why none of this makes Star Trek, the original series, anything like camp. It makes it an older show with different assumptions about the future, with different technological limitations in terms of filmmaking, and a different way of telling a story. But it is not camp, and it never was. Now, in 50 years, or if people are still watching Star Trek Discovery and Star Trek Picard, I have no doubt that younger fans will say that it's campy because it will look fake and stupid and hokey looking, and it will not match the future as it actually came true. They will lack the perspective to understand that it's not. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds. <laughs>